So I want to thank everybody for watching my videos on YouTube and uh, just want to let you know that I'm not very good at this. Uh, I just like trying to get some content out that some people might find interesting or may not have access to get. So um, I'm going to be rebooting a video that um, I have recently uh, published, but the graphics kind of got messed up and the voicing voiceovers didn't work out so well. So I'm going to reboot it and see if it comes out better. So you might look at this and say, well, I've already seen this video. Uh, hopefully it's improved. Hopefully the audio is improved. And again, I just want to thank you for your patience in watching the videos. Okay, here we go. The year 1956 was a lot of firsts for Elvis Presley. He had his first million seller with Heartbreak Hotel. He bought his first home on Audubon. Presley made his first national television debut appearing on CBS's stage show. He made his first movie, Love Me Tender, but there is one not so well known first for Elvis. September 1956 was Elvis's first and only byline in a magazine. While there were many interviews, articles, photos of Elvis in numerous magazines and newspapers in 1956, there is only one I know of that has by Elvis Presley with his own byline. It appears in the September 1956 Rod Builder and Customizer magazine. Elvis explains when and how his fascination with cars began. The article is called Rock and Roll and Drag by Elvis Presley. He wrote, I've been wild about cars almost since I can remember. When I was six years old, singing songs for folk gatherings in Tupelo, Mississippi, I recall feeling sad because we had to walk while all those sleek cars passed on us on the road. Yes, way back in those rough old days when Dad couldn't spare the cash to buy me a guitar, I used to dream about ridiculous things like Cadillacs and such. As I got older, my car taste began to change a little. I remember craving a Lincoln Continental, a classic Packard, then a Model T, and finally a 32 Roadster. I wanted a 32 so bad I think I'll never crave anything as much again. I dreamed about souping it up, customizing it, and maybe dragging it out a little. As I grew older, I'm 21 now, I looked more and more longingly at the antique cars I used to see in the magazines. Once I even saw a beautiful Bugatti parked in front of a big old house in Biloxi. I knew it would take money to own one of those classics and I was sure I'd never have enough. Cars, any kind, were out of the question for me. I was picking out tunes on a $2.98 guitar, so how could I afford anything that cost $2,000? Nearest I ever got to in those days was a part-time job cleaning up a garage in town. Then I finished high school and began to try real hard for the big time. I cut some records and almost before I knew it, I had cash, enough of it to fix the family up comfortable and bought myself a dozen guitars and a dozen cars if I wanted them. Well, I'm a little ashamed to admit it, but I bought me three little old Cadillacs, the kind I first craved 15 years ago. There's a yellow sedan, a pink convertible, and a big black limousine which I can take the folks around in. Then after I got those off my chest, I bought a three-wheeler measure strip. This is a cool little buggy, if ever there was one. Perfect for zooming around town when I'm home. And she gives me almost 50 miles to the gallon. I have a motorcycle too, but I don't get much of a chance to ride it these days. The most important thing though, I still haven't forgotten. It's that 32. 
and one of these days, very soon, as a matter of fact, I'm going to have enough time to shop for it. And as soon as things quiet down, they'll find me in the garage, chopping and channeling away like crazy. If there's any time left over, I'll be out on the strips, maybe even competing. Rotting is for me. In 1955, Elvis had purchased a Ford Model A, also called the A Model Ford, or the A, and A-Bone among hot rodders and customizers for Red West. Elvis probably having it in his head that they could turn it into a hot rod, a project that never came to fruition. When I was going to college, when I got the scholarship, Owens County, the Owens County, he, he, we were on a road coming back from a one night uh, stand somewhere. We were driving through Corinth, Mississippi. All of a sudden, he hit the brake, swerved, and went in. And I'm sitting in the car waiting. And he came out, handed me some car keys, and said, uh, that's yours over there. It's, it's an A model, 1927 A model. Really? And I, I said, man, <laughs> okay, thank you. And he, he said, go on, drive, drive her home. So he took off. And I started this, I didn't know, man, they had all these <laughs> levers and stuff I'd never seen before, it was a spark and gas. And, and, but it turned on, and I, I drove that thing to Memphis. And I was, I was leaving for college like the next week. Then in 1960, uh, we see in Elvis's carport and Model A Ford. The article associated with the photo states that the car had belonged to Vernon. It has been said that Vernon liked to collect old cars and fiddle around with them. I could imagine that Vernon and Elvis planned that one day they would turn this into a hot rod. Or it was actually the car Elvis had bought Red West that was parked there. Although Elvis never had the time to build his own hot rod, in 1970, Elvis bought his first of five Stutz Blackhawks, one which was wrecked and later restored, one which was given away, one that he leased, and two more that he purchased. There is no doubt that the Stutz Blackhawk resembled the hot rods Elvis dreamed about building and dragging. The Stutz had many similar features, a spare tire, that protruded through the trunk lid, massive kidney grill, freestanding headlamps, and the side pipes. However, the studs came with more luxury than most hot rods. One thing is for certain, Elvis's obsession with cars, which was evident at a young age and which he himself wrote about in 1956. Before I finish, I want to say a couple of things that need to be said. Some people make nasty remarks about hot rodders, just the way they sometimes do about rock and roll music, and the kids who love it. Neither are fair. Sure, there are some irresponsible kids who break the rules, but they're the exception, and that holds true about rotting as well as rock and rolling. Outlaws never set the pace. All you can ever do is your honest best, and as long as it's constructive and peaceful, you can feel proud. There's little we can do about the few people who would like to destroy everything because a little part of something is bad. 